Wait for it, wait for it, and we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. It's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans and one chaos coordinator geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place we are, the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, we are going to let our guests introduce themselves to you, to your listener, dear viewer. We're going to start with you, Mr. Chris Denote. Hey everybody, Chris the Note, uh, newbie sci-fi author. Um, you can find me on Amazon. Um, sometimes collaborate uh, with my wife and a few authors uh, out there as well. Uh, happy to be here. All right, and we invited him on the podcast today where we're going to talk about uh, the role of waterborne naval units in a FTL sci-fi kind of world. Because uh, back in his younger days, he used to do the same thing for planes. So I figured the experience will give you some insight. I'm trying to be vague and, you know, like not make this your official position. The answer the line. I don't have your experience in public relations. All right, Chris? Jeez. <laughs> public relations. Is that what they call it? Uh, not sticking your foot in your mouth, whatever that's called. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Yeah, they call that tack, JR. J- oh, JR sure. doesn't have any experience in not sticking his foot in his mouth. <laughs> no, I do not. I do not. All right. Next, we have Mr. Jim Curtis. Oh, good evening. I write uh, primarily indie uh, three series out. I've been in about 16 different anthologies, retired naval flight officer, so also prior Mustang enlisted. So I kind of seen both sides of the coin. And I have places on the net. And all of that will be linked in the show notes, dear listener. You know the drill. Click the uh, open, expand, click the links, buy their books. That's how this works, people. All right, last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Rick Partlow. Hi, I'm Rick Partlow. Um, I write military science fiction and space opera. I have, uh, I think at the moment, 69 published novels out. I'm almost finished with 70. Um, and I'm, I've written mostly from the ground pounder point of view, but I have some uh, fleet style stuff too. And no experience whatsoever with the Navy. So I'm, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Water though, and you lived in Florida. That's almost the same thing, right? That's true. I lived right in the center of the state. <laughs> Wait, I thought you were on the, okay. I thought you were on the beach for some reason. No, no. That's for rich people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's fair. That's fair. I'm but at one point. It's the Redneck Riviera, don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as long as you keep your cooler beer cold. But at one point in time, you also uh, played Army and, you know, did the whole infantry officer thing. So that counts as well. You were what? Tropical Lightning, right? Tro- yeah, 25th Infantry Division. Yeah. At one point in time, I remember because they were getting all the strikers and one of the, um, bless their hearts, one of our government politicians asked if putting the strikers on Hawaii might make the island tip over. Now, that was Puerto Rico, wasn't it? No, no. Um, they, he did <laughs> both. No, <laughs> they, I was they, they, Oh, they, Guam, they were, right. Guam, that's right. But they were yeah. also worried about the weight of the strikers and the effect on the coral reef might make the island sink. I was just being flippant. Oh. Um, uh, they don't understand was, geology or geography. When I, when I was with the 25th, we did not have strikers or anything else that would keep us from having to walk except for helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was with it for 25th, the uh, 25th Fighter Squadron in Os- at uh, Osam in Korea. Okay. Basically the same thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> All right. you have to like that. Yeah, yeah, you can't go wrong with that. So the next part of the introduction, dear listeners, how we found them. So uh, we were all at the local watering hole, and I just shanghaied them, and here we are. So we'll, we'll dive in. Because of the topic today, we're going to mix up the religion question. So I hope all of you are ready for this. All right. Millennium Falcon, USS Enterprise, or Battlestar Galactica? We're going to start with you, Jim. Pick your poison. Uh, Millennium Falcon. Do you like the uh, the old beat up, what's old is new again vibe? Is that what does it for you? Yeah, that and what I flew in the military. Hell, it was older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about you, Rick? Well, if you're asking which one that I think is coolest, that would be the Millennium Falcon. If you're asking which one I'd rather have, it'd be the Enterprise because it's got like transporters and phasers and defense shields and all that other stuff that would keep me alive. <laughs> Fair. All right. What about you, Chris? Um, I'd probably take the Enterprise because uh, it works most of the time. 
unlike the Falcon and uh, the Battlestar Galactica. Black, uh, blah, the Galactica. Blah. How you doing? <laughs> I don't know, man. If it's anything like getting the Navy ships I've been on, it's going to break every five seconds or something like that and smell horrible. Plus, they have all those those analog phones. That would really get annoying. Yeah. So it, I, and I guess we should see too when you pick that thing up. <laughs> <laughs> what? So so I guess we could specify with the Battlestar Galactica when it was in its prime or when it was a museum ship because I guess that's a different answer. Um. All oh, right. Really? You don't think? Either or for Gal Galactica. Okay. All right. And uh, the next one, the TARDIS, Serenity, or Prometheus. All right, Chris. Uh. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Probably the Serenity. Uh, if that, if those are my choices, then yeah, yeah, Serenity all the way. All right, Rick. Uh, I picked the TARDIS because you got all that living space and time travel. I mean, how can you go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. What about you, Jim? I'll have to go again. Old school with Serenity. Okay. All right. So this is more of an open-ended question to sort of get us thinking about future space navies. But obviously, militaries have their own traditions, and uh, a lot of them have been around longer than the people. Uh, and sometimes we don't even know why we do the things we do. But if you think forward to a, uh, a space navy, what traditions from modern militaries do you think we'll keep? Uh, well, since you're scratching your head, Rick, you can go first. I wasn't, but uh, I, I am lost. Uh, th they'll probably keep the same terminology, you know, bulkhead, hull, uh, you know, helm, <laughs> all the all the Navy stuff. They'll probably keep that because, I mean, you have to – if not, you're going to have to come up with a new word for it, you know, deck, overhead. Okay. I'll, I'll jump on that one. Uh, I think Rick's basically right. The terminology will transfer, but I think that the other thing that will transfer is the ultimate responsibility of the CO to operate independently and the traditions that we've had in the Navy since day two, <laughs> as far as the officer enlisted, uh, the way those are handled and the team effort that it takes to get on a, sh a ship underway. Because it's not like, for example, the Air Force, where the pilot comes out, climbs in an airplane, goes and flies away by himself. You know, it takes an entire team to get a ship underway. And the watch standing is always a mixed bag, where you have a watch officer, and then you have an enlisted watch team that supports him. Okay. Chris? Well, um, this would this be more one for Jim, but um, I was kind of thinking, um, what would be the uh, future Space Navy equivalent of uh, the shellback ritual? What do you think would be the criteria for that? What counts as crossing the equator if you're, uh, if you're a Space Navy? Crossing the orbit of Mars. That's the outer, outer solar system. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it depends. Depends on how big the uh, the galaxy you're inhabiting it is. So is it, are you stuck to the Earth's solar system? In which case, yeah, probably Mars makes sense to me. If we're going past that, uh, I guess maybe the halfway mark between the two main organizations, would I would bet? Uh, I would, I would, well, now the other thing I would think about, is if you want a, a tradition, is the earring for seven seas. So you would have to go through seven galaxies to be able to wear an earring. Well, or I mean, depending on how fast your FTL is, maybe just seven solar systems. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. Okay. All right. I think definitely you're going to see the uh, the old military trope of the hot, the coffee that's like part like oil, part coffee uh, that'll hold the spoon straight up. I think that stands. Oh, we'll um, never give up our coffee. No, <laughs> not the Navy. Um, I still have vivid memories of the uh, the chief I met in Iraq standing there in the middle of a sandstorm with a firefight going on. And he's just sipping his coffee, letting us do our thing. Not a care in the world. Bullets Man. flying by. He's just drinking his coffee. Yep. Uh, I asked him about it after the firefight. And he told me that in the uh, part of the chief's initiation is they have to survive standing on the deck of a ship in the middle of a typhoon and not spill a drop. That's like yeah. one of the requirements. 
Hmm. I have not uh, verified. That. How, how are they going to get a typhoon to order though? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Taco Tuesday, maybe. I don't know. Well, now another tradition talking about coffee in the Navy. Whoever takes the last cup makes the next pot, regardless of rank. Oh, okay. And I have seen a two-star admiral make a pot of coffee. Does the Air Force do that, Chris? I, generally speaking, there's a yeah, there's a rule. There's a rule. At until least. they get until they get like the food synthesizers, and it's you know, just give me a coffee. <laughs> well, that just takes all the fun out of it, though. You know what yeah. I mean? So when we did coffee in the army, it was either every man for themselves kind of thing, because I was in line unit, infantry line unit, so it wasn't like we were office bound. Uh, and then in the field, we always had the mess bring it to us. So whoever the cooks were would bring those green thermite containers that probably put plastic in our bloodstream and thermite. Know. I don't. What's, what's, it called? what's it made out of? That green plastic? It's not thermite. Thermite is like uh, the stuff that's in grenades that melts metal. <laughs> I mean, it's surprising if they put that in there. Ice, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I just—it's the green pl hard plastic containers they bring beverages out to us in. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Well, if you know what it is, dear listener, write in the comment section. But I, I can vision—I I can picture it in my head. It's like this green, like rectangle with a spigot on it, where they would bring us the the hot beverages when it was. They it was were cold. called Marmite. Marmite, that might Marmite, be. yes, that's it. Yeah. I was close-ish. I knew it wasn't it? thermite. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I hope it's not thermite. I yeah. mean. Uh, all right, all right. We'll move on so I don't look like more of an ass than I normally do. And uh, all right. You're so fine. if we are uh, looking at a world where we're getting our first FTL ship, that's the first of its kind, what would you name it if you were? I'll, I'll go first. I think I would name the first one the Mad Hatter. Because you got to be crazy as a loon to, to be the first man on that. Any any other ideas? I never the Armstrong. Okay. I can tell you what I wouldn't name it, and that's Event Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> or, or the Titanic. Uh, all right. Or so the Star Discovery. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Rick, are we talking Lance or Neil? Is he doing steroids or is he just the first Neil. time? No, it's not. It's not for the, the guy with uh, the steroids and one testicle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What about you, Jim? Depending on which country or whether it's one, I would either say Constitution or Enterprise. Okay. Iconic. All the iron sides would be a good one. Well, are we talking a military FTL ship or an exploration one? Because that would make a difference in what you name it, too. So I've got a question for you, Chris, because you you dealt with planes in the Air Force. When a plane is being tested before it's officially accepted into service, um, is it considered property of the military yet or property of the company making it? Um, shoot. There's different phases of it, right? I mean, um, yeah. there's the there's the company's test articles that they're going to work with, which are their property. And then there's the ones that are delivered to the Air Force uh, for test and evaluation and the different phases of test. That's not my... It's not my bailiwick, so I'm offering you how I think it works. I mean, I, I do know that, like, um, the, before the, the planes are delivered, or if they're never intended to be delivered to the military, like if they're a pure uh, tech demonstrator or, or just an in-company asset that's being used as a to work out certain systems, you know, that's that's property of the company. And then there's, a, I think it's one of the article is actually no kidding, formally delivered to the Air Force for whatever purposes test and evaluation or, or, or whatnot, or a prototype or what have you, I think that's property of the service. But I think that also depends on the contract and, and okay. what the contract calls for. I know so, when the Ar when the Army got the LA LMTVs, I think it was, the uh, that were their attempt to replace the Humvee, uh, they were trained the trainer kind of thing. So they got all the senior NCOs that would be teaching the drivers how to do their thing. And uh, it hadn't even been officially signed by the Army, and they already wrecked it oh, because yeah. it, it, it rolled. <laughs> so it was still it was still company property. I remember that was a big deal in the Army Times that the civilians had to eat it because they hadn't officially transferred it yet. Oh, and, and it was damaged because of their, I guess, their design flaw or whatever. Whoopsie. Yep. <laughs> now for aircraft, right. for aircraft, if a military pilot is flying it, it has to be accepted by the military. Okay. And if you're flying it, for example, 
uh, F-18, or actually F-35 for that matter. <clears throat> the original deliveries of F-35s were to Patuxent River for TPS to play with. And they became official Navy property the day they were flown in by the contractor manufacturer. What about something like the X-15 where they had civilian test pilots and, and military ones flying? Who did it belong to? Well, that was, that was at Edwards. Right. And that was never a Air Force airplane. No, it was NASA, wasn't it? It was NASA, yeah. Yeah. And, and NASA, you know, has employed civilian test pilots and military test pilots. Um, so, And also, keep in mind, too, is that you can have articles that are owned by the service, but they hire contractors to fly them specifically. Um, like, you know, a good case of, like, where things are kind of hybridized now is you see all the companies that do uh, third-party uh, air adversary training, right? Yeah. All the private companies that own, like, old X uh, European uh, third-gen fighters and things like that or even – and they use those for the similar air combat training. Those are mostly, those are all flown by contractors. Yep. Um, and I believe they own and they still maintain the equipment. But uh, even for like, uh, even for like, uh, say the uh, Air Force's test planes and oh, by the way, all the QF, remember back when we had QF4 drones, we had yep. uh, the QF16 drones, now the full scale target drones, they call them for training. They've got contractors who fly those, even though that those are uh, military, uh, military assets. But they've also had, you know, they also have uniform people flying uh, also. Okay. So I, I would I would assume if the company was going to give it a name, it would probably be something related to whatever company is making it. And let's just hope for the pilot's sake that it's not Boeing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the last question before we dive into the topic that brought us here is uh, we are no, we are civilized human beings here at the Blasters Blaze podcast. We are no longer knuckle dragging, troggle dragging. So how do you take your coffee or tea in the summer heat? You still drink it hot and black? Hot and black. Okay. Rick? You know I don't drink coffee or tea. <laughs> One day you're going to grow up and you will. And you're going to surprise me. I am that. never, JR, I am never going to grow up. It's way too late for that. <laughs> <laughs> So what did you drink when you were in the army? Did you not drink the MRE I, coffee? No, I did not. I just drank water and sometimes with like drink packages in it. That's it. So, so in the cold weather, you didn't you didn't have anything to warm I'm you up. In Hawaii, Jr. <laughs> Your entire time. Uh, well, I mean, when I was in training in Georgia, it was cold. I I still didn't drink coffee. No. Wow. I didn't think you could make it through and not, not drink the bit, the Java. Okay. All right. What about you, Chris? Uh, for coffee, hot cream, no sugar. And, uh, for tea. Yeah. If I got a stomach ache or something like that, I'll, I'll switch to tea. Okay. Yeah. I, I like it hot most of the time, but I have recently discovered the joy of, uh, iced coffee when made right. Uh, the trick I learned from Stabby is you make your ice cubes with coffee. So when they melt, you melt coffee in your coffee and you don't get that watered down effect. And I heard you like fun. coffee in your coffee, so I put coffee in your coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. That's that's how it's done. All right. So we were talking about it in the pre-show, and we, we mentioned this is the topic, but this started with a, a co-writer and mine. We were discussing whether a world that had faster than light travel and the Space Navy, whatever you call it, would still have need for uh, naval vessels that float in oceans in that sort of future. And I thought it'd be an interesting conversation. So uh, as we get started, does anybody have any opening thoughts on the idea? I think a lot of it would have to do with what your technology is. I mean, there's all kinds of different space navies you can have from something that's totally realistic and honestly a little boring to write and read or <laughs> something further out, you know, like Star Trekian type of deal. And if you have the further out one that has like all the anti-gravity and where ships the size of aircraft carriers can go down in the atmosphere, well, then you don't need a blue water Navy. But if you have a more realistic and closer to what we have now, Space Navy, that's ships that can only survive in, you know, in zero, in a free fall, and you still have to maintain order on the ground, you'll probably still need a blue water Navy. Okay. I, I uh, think, um, I, I think a lot of it depends too, is if, if you're, 
planets are unitary type governments or if they're uh, still made up of multiple polities, some or all of which might be spacefaring. I mean, kind of like what we are right now, right? I mean, just because a you, you know just because a uh, planet is spacefaring in a, in a setting, it doesn't mean that it's a united single polity. Very and, true. Uh, and you know, I mean, I, I look at it this way too. I was just thinking that there's planets are big, right? For the most part, and if they're somewhat or even mostly ocean. That's a lot. I mean, it's the big, big planet, you know, small ship, small uh, whatever theory. Um, and that's, uh, you're going to need something like a Coast Guard. You're going to need to do something to secure travel on the water. So even if instead of a wet, you know, blue water, modern day wet Navy, you've got at least something like a Coast Guard or a Constabulary, you're probably going to need some, something like that. And uh, I was also thinking, you know, one of the things that when you brought up this topic that I reverted right back to is I used to be a big battle Battletech player back in the day. And um, I remember the 3026 technical readout and it was all the conventional vehicles and stuff. And they actually had entries on ships. Now, their idea was that, you know, hey, this was part of the planetary militia. I think the story they had in there was like a yacht club that decided it was going to be a militia. And I think they modeled it off of like similar clubs back in the way back in the day, either in the UK and Great Britain or uh, New England, uh, where, you know, so that uh, rich people, could, you know, rich boys could do their military service by being part of the Naval Reserve or something like that. Let's mount a Bofors gun on my yacht. Yeah. Well, <laughs> kind of what they did in this was that um, they had a yacht club that was basically funding the planetary militia. So when I, I think it was the Curetans invaded, you know, they took their boats, they took their boats went off to the hinterlands and waged a uh, pretty effective guerrilla campaign. I mean, if you're in a world where the primary threat is something like, oh, battle mechs, you know, about a dozen or hundreds, and um, you don't have that, you know, you, you, you kind of need to make do with what you got. And let's face it, you know, big robots tend to not do very well in water, well, uh, whether it's coastal or... they're transformers. <laughs> well, then you're kind of hosed either way, so, you know, That's you got to... You're giving me vibes of the Cajun Navy from the uh, Katrina where they were kind of people took their personal boats and they sort of were part cop, part rescue ranger uh, during Katrina. I, I could see something like that happening, too. Well, yeah. like, well, like um, <coughs> from Apocalypse Now, right? Never get out of the boat. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I think it uh, I would tend to agree with Chris. It depends on the policies involved. But it also depends on how much of the planet is water. Okay. Because that's going to be a big driver. Well, I mean, we don't know for sure, but I think there's, it's going to be difficult to have a planet that's habitable that doesn't have at least, you know, maybe two thirds of the planet being water. Yeah, maybe half, maybe two thirds. But at, at the same time, to go with what you were talking about, Rick. If you have other means of moving around, you have anagrav, you have something like that, you may or may not actually need a waterborne force per se, or you need something that can do both anagravity and waterborne. Like a, sub, a submarine style spaceship, like those Tic Tacs. <laughs> oh, and anime or, loves, loves or, that trope. Yeah. Anime loves submersible yeah. spaceships. I mean, yeah. you go back to... Do well, you remember the flying sub from... from uh, Travis Taylor, yeah. yeah. Well, no, the flying sub from uh, the TV show uh, in the 70s, 60s. Uh, what's it called? Oh, yeah. oh. Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, I think. Yeah, something yeah. like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then yeah. don't forget, they even did that trope in the old XCOM game. Remember uh, Terror from the Deep? The, yeah. uh, if you're old like me or us, you know, you remember playing that, you know, you had submersible UFOs and stuff like that. It was pretty neat. I think they were in that British TV series UFO too. The other thing you could also do is use that as a training ground for your people that are going to space. Because <clears throat> one of the things that's different with the Navy compared to the other services is the CO is the final voice. In other words, he's not reporting to anybody higher. Or I, no, I take it back. He's not taking direction from anybody higher when he's out on operations. He or she is in charge. And that's the same thing you have in space. You know, that <clears throat> There's no reach back to somebody on the ground to tell them what to do. 
I guess that depends on whether or not they have instantaneous communications. <laughs> I doubt in FTL that you would have instantaneous communications. I mean, we don't have any idea what FTL is going to be like anyway, so it's all. Yeah. If we're talking fiction, though, a lot of there, there's some that do, many that don't. Yeah. Yeah. I think what it is too is we've gotten so used to living in a uh, an environment where near instantaneous, if not instantaneous, communications we take it for granted. I mean, uh, you know, you can never, we can all complain uh, from our military careers about the three thousand mile screwdriver, yeah. uh, you know, given tactical direction or something like that. But yeah. um, it's one of the things that's kind of interesting is you know, in the long run, you know, is space going to look more like submarine warfare, which you know a lot of you know you brought up Travis Taylor and other people have done. Or shoot, go back to Star Trek Two, you know, with the Wrath of Khan. I mean, that was the model. One of the best science fiction movies ever. Yeah. Right. I mean, so I, I tend to think it's probably going to be more like that. But also, how much you know terrain, the you know space terrain, do you need to control with how many how many vessels and how many assets in order to do it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it kind of goes back to you know what Jim was talking about too. It's it's one thing if like you know planet's just part of your key terrain it's another thing if you have to capture and hold or deny terrain on the planet in order yeah. to achieve the, the objectives you want in which case you know kind of go back to the battletech example hey, you know 30 foot tall mechs might be a really crappy solution if if you're trying to destroy enemies that are hiding out in like the cajun navy example swamps and hinterlands and bayous and all that other kind of stuff and sooner or later a bunch of yahoos but a couple missile launchers you know, we're going to be able to hold off a uh, an attack for a really long time. I don't care what you got, unless you just decide to nuke it from orbit or go 40k style on the place. Start start dropping rods from gods in the swamp. <laughs> the rods from God only work to a certain point, though, because you know now you're going to take it into the city, so you're going to destroy the cities. You know who makes that final call. Is it the CEO of the boat? Is it somebody on the ground? That's a really good point because this one CEO on a BOAT in orbit, does he have all the authority in the world? You know, you know, at that place, yeah. or does he have to sit tight and, until he actually does hear from higher on, you know, one would hope he would have ROE and everything before they, before they send him out on, send him out wherever. But um, that's a really good point. Yeah. That, that like we're talking about depends on the, both the speed of your, it depends on the speed of your communication. You know, if you can either call back to base and instantly or within hours, you might say, Hey, you know, what, what do you want me to do? But if, if it takes, if the fastest way to get a message from base is to send it on a ship, well, then you're going to have like the 18th century captains who are God on that ship. Yeah. So speaking of 18th, Century, you mentioned the training, the wet navy being almost training ground for, for young officers. And I'm thinking, isn't it the don't the Coast Guard Academy and doesn't Annapolis have actual like small boats like that that they use for that purpose to train the midshipmen? Yes, uh, they I do. Seem, I seem to remember the Coast Guard has a sailboat they sail up and down the coast with midshipmen. Yeah, Coast Guard. The no, Eagle. They sail it all the, world. the Eagle. Yeah. Uh, if you ever you're read. Uh, Island in the Sea of Time by S.M. Sterling. He, go, he talks about that ship a lot. <laughs> no, you hit on something else too, Jim. I'm surprised we don't see more people do this. Is like have actually part of your Space Navy's training regimen is to actually train in water because of at least somewhat similarities to operating under you know different gravi gravity and, and yeah. things like that and all that. Well, if, you have a, you have, if you have a Space Navy, you could have them train like in free fall or on planets, you know, so. Yeah, but I guess that comes down to expense and then how dangerous it is. Cause I mean, one thing I think it overlooked too is just how freaking dangerous space actually is, you know, not to go yeah. off on another tangent. Yeah, so two, does of my, two of my OSCS classmates are both, both became astronauts. Ironically, it was to the females, Wendy Lawrence and Kay Hire. And Wendy was a pilot. She became a helicopter pilot, went to TPS, and then went to uh, space program. And Kay was a naval flight officer, and she came up through the engineering side of the house. But they both trained in the water in Houston for all the space stuff. 
Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Didn't we train in pools when we were training the astronauts to get used to the, the space? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep, that's exactly. They trained in Houston, a special pool. Okay, and I, I seem to. I, I imagine some of that would be useful because you know there are going to be water planets where potentially you have you know part astronaut, part aquanaut, as far as you know stations on various worlds. Yeah. So. All right, well, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man, and then we'll jump right back into this discussion. So uh, give us a listen and grab your coffee, and we'll be right back. Gunnery Sergeant John Doe is frustrated. He didn't join the Space Corps to be shuttled around in a ship. He joined to fight. So far, he has only seen a few skirmishes. He itches for a fight, something he can use to impress his junior Space Marines, as well as use to pick up chicks. Now that he's aboard the USS Big Stick, he hopes things will be different. The Space Federation has defeated their longtime enemy and has decided another war was just what the people needed. One was intentional, the other was not. Either way, Gunny is excited. Now Gunny and the rest of the ship's crew must fight for their lives against an enemy none of them saw coming. What could possibly go wrong? Dive into the Vacuum Suck Hard Adventures of the USS Big Stick by J.R. Hanley and Chris Winder, and find out for yourself. All right, thank you for sticking with us through that commercial interlude. Uh, I felt like a funny one, and I hadn't aired that commercial in a while. So with that being said, all right, we were talking about, you know, the role of, of uh, blue water wet navies in a, in a space future. So do you think if we kept those forces, if they were served, sort of serving as a part policing, part Coast Guard action, would they be part of the Navy, or would they be organized into something else? I, I think would, that that would. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, Rick. I was going to say I think that depends on your political situation. Like Chris was saying, do you have nations that might go to war on that planet, or are you just policing like maybe a few rogue elements? If you're doing that, it might just be like a a coast guard setup. But if you have like a you a, if you had an Earth that still had Russia and China and whatever in the U.S and we're all out in space and possibly fighting in the ocean, then you'd still have a Navy. I think, too, is like if it's a more uni unified situation and you're more interested in defending against a hostile stellar power, it might just be part of your defensive forces. It might be closer to a militia, uh, actually, you know what I mean, or something more dual status, a dual role, uh, in which case, you know, like that, and again, you know, the one to beat the Battletech horse to death, but I thought that was a really good way to handle it, to tell you the truth. It was a realist, semi-realistic way uh, to actually handle it, how it might be, because then it also talks about realistically how it's going to be equipped, right? I mean, um, because you're looking at something that's a little bit more brown water looking than it is blue water looking, I would think. And if it's, you know, and the Coast Guard these days is a really interesting hybrid because they have those giant national security, well, giant for them, national security cutters and some larger ships that are, you know, more... Closer to, I mean, for, for other countries' navies, those are major service combatants, you know, what the Coast Guard has these days. So, uh, you know, kind of going back with both Rick and, and uh, Jim are saying, I think it kind of depends. I think the politics drives it. The politics, or is it, like I said, are, are we worried about, you know, a full-blown alien invasion? Or we need to have some sort of defensive force and capability to, um, uh, to you know, you know, that could be a, a stay behind or, uh, you know, doing you know do a regular warfare or uh, something along those lines the other thing that no, nobody has mentioned yet is the rescue because you're going to have storms if you have a world of water you're going to have storms and having been involved in a couple of rescues over the years that's ugly and the navy ships are one of the few things on earth that can get there in a timely fashion and actually provide enough support to keep people alive. The other thing is, what if you're taking over a world and the polity there is a different race, a different a set of aliens, for example, and you need a police force? You know, how you want to write that, which way you want to take that is up to you. But I think that I, I think they will be applicable in any case 
but it depends, as both the other gentlemen have said, on how you actually intend to use it and what the actual requirement is. All right, here's a good here's a good one too, Jim. Too is um, if, honestly, if I wanted to defend, say, Earth from a, a hostile and alien invasion and have a chance of success, I'd want to be fighting from the seabed. Yep. You know, submarines, especially yeah, definitely. Like dirt submarines that can stay mobile. You know, because the ocean's big, it's really deep, and it's really inhospitable. Yep. And you know what I mean. If you wanted to, if you wanted to defend, you know, globally, then you would, you'd be stupid not to, you know, shift a lot of emphasis and capability into the seabed or uh, subsurface areas to do it, especially below the continental shelf. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, very, it's very hard to see through water. But <clears throat> when I it's, that depends on. What kind of technology they have. <laughs> when I thought of the idea, I was actually thinking like modern Navy as we think of it now, but I hadn't even considered the role of subs because it's not something, you know, you see a lot. I mean, obviously they're the there. You, know they're there you, but. you mentioned it to me. That was actually the first thing I thought of was that one of the biggest things that would be handy about a Navy in, a, in, a few, in the future was submarines. Interesting. Well, radar doesn't work. LIDAR doesn't work. Uh, lasers basically don't work. Uh, you want to launch it doesn't work through water. You want to launch a boatload of missiles at somebody, man. You don't get a lot of warning. Yeah, yeah. And you can launch both uh, planetary and into space from a submarine. Well, now, depending on depending on how good our rockets are. <laughs> Now I'm picturing like a, a spaceship hovering over the water, dumping a submarine out the back <laughs> on some <laughs> alien planet. Get to work, boys. Yeah. Or landing. Yeah. Every spaceship double as a submarine. Yeah. That's an interesting design feature because submarines have to be designed to take the pressure as they go deep. But are those same factors in hull design there for spaceships? Because they're not worried about water pressure against them. And I just recently, about- I recently read an article about this. Actually, it was interesting. The only thing, I mean, you could make a submarine a spaceship except for one thing, and that's heat dispersion. Because modern submarines can radiate heat into the water, but if you're in space, you have to have radiators of some kind. Like, uh, but I mean, if you're if you're flying FTL, I imagine you've kind of got the whole heat radiation thing solved or you wouldn't be able to do it. So you might have something like a a craft that can put out heat radiators when it's in space and pull them back in for combat or when it goes under the water. Yeah. Well, and also you would have to, <clears throat> in space, you'd have to rotate it to not burn one part and freeze the other part of whatever ship you were on. Oh, that's a good point. That's, Terry that's Mixon. One the, that's one of the real issues with the ISS. Is they have Terry to basically keep rotating it. Well, I guess that depends on how close you are to a, a star. Yeah. Well, even well, the, the sun, as far as we are from the sun, is still the same problem. Because you've got the dissimilar temperatures in extremes, literally. On the same ship. So you, you mentioned the submarines, Rick. Uh, Terry Mixon actually wrote a short story called Warfish. It was inspired by um, an actual accounts of World War II submariners. Um, we've, we've talked to him about it on this podcast. That actually took the concept of submarines and basically stuck them in space. But instead of going underwater, so when they're below water as opposed to when they're on the surface, it was when they were in some sort of slipstream versus when they were in regular space was the differential. The Glenn, actually- Cook, Glenn Cook wrote a whole novel about that. Uh, it's called uh, – oh, man, I'm, I'm, it, the, the title's escaping me, but it, it was basically a submarine. They called them climbers because regular ships could go into hyperspace. And these climbers could go into, like, another dimension of hyperspace and uh, – strike at regular ships in hyperspace from there. I uh, didn't Ringo, John Ringo have a book um, about they took a like an SSBN or an SS, uh, SS attack sub and converted it into a spaceship. I think that was one of the uh, stories. Yes, that was, a, that was the, uh, the uh, Looking Glass novels, right? 
Yep. I think so. It's been a while. Yeah, that was that was the looking glass. The first one was a uh, was a, a submarine. I that think was, they yeah. I'll have to dig those links up, dear listeners, so you can find them in the show notes and check them out yourself. Uh, cause it's worth reading. I, I, I swear by Warfish is an excellent story. I wish Terry would write that as a series. A passage uh, at arms is the one by Glenn cook. Yes. Passage in arms. Right. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes, but, uh, it's, it's an interesting concept and I do think it's a good parallel. I know, uh, in 2016, when I was at RavenCon, they had one of the, um, panels on space navies. And uh, one of the naval officers of the submarine said he couldn't command the Enterprise, and this was as close as he was going to get, so he became a submarine officer mm. um, as, as part of his speech. So, I mean, there's definitely parallels, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, in, including not, not go, being able to see sun. Not to go off on a tangent, but I I got to tour the um, USS Drum, I think it was, over at Mobile Bay. Uh, it's a World War II submarine. And I could not have been on one of those things. It was just like a claustrophobic nightmare. Oh, those things are tiny, man. I think it's the Balfin that's out at uh, Pearl Harbor or nearby oh, that okay. there. Yeah, I, I toured that a few years ago, and I was like, yeah, no thanks. You know what I mean? I was ready to get off at the second second. It's, I got off it's funny because in Mobile, they have the USS uh, um, Alabama, yeah. the battleship. And they had the drum right next to it. So you get yeah. to go from a battleship where it's like a football field, you know, and, and you're, everything's wide open. And then you go in the drum and you can barely fit through the door and the place where they slept. I would have been, I would have like had nightmares just getting into that. I've well, been on a submarine myself. Too, in World War II, the average sailor, Marine, whatever, was only about five, five or five, six. And no, no. a lot of them, you know, they weighed under 150 pounds. So they were actually very small. They were about the size of what the Japanese are today. You know, you well, didn't see a six footer was an oddity back in World War II. So I've, I've been on a submarine myself. The USS Claymore is at Patriots Point in Charleston, South Carolina. And you are right, Rick. It is very claustrophobic to uh, to walk on those old ships. And, and just the, the carrier that's there, the Yorktown, is already small enough spaces. And that's a carrier. I, I can't imagine doing that underwater where you can't, like, at least get some fresh air. Yeah. Mm. Well, the, and I hate to tell you guys this, but the new submarines aren't much better. I would not be surprised to hear that. The I've ridden a few submarines over the years, including 688s. And three-man stateroom is for officers. Three-man stateroom for officers is about six feet wide, about nine feet high, and maybe 15 feet deep. And you've got three racks, you've got three desks, and all the storage in there. And that's where the office. I can't imagine the desks. <laughs> yeah. They fall yeah. down or something? Yeah. yeah. My, my, my stepdad did 23 years in the Navy, and that was always his biggest complaint is the um, their government mandates that prisoners are required to have more space in their cells than sailors get in their birthing compartments. That is true. Um, and our U.S. boats are bigger than any of the foreign boats. Oh. I've been on Australian, Swedish, and Norwegian boats, and they are tiny. I mean, you're talking about how big the World War II boats are. The foreign Navy ships are the same size today. Wow. Some of so, them don't even have full-size hatches. You go from forward to aft. You literally have to go through a four-foot hatch round hatch you get from forward to aft. So in a lot of the sci-fi, you see open corridors uh, and doors that just sort of open for you because you want to be able to see the actors, right? Do you yeah. think in a modern futuristic um, space Navy, you're going to end up more like hatches like you see in the modern Navy to make various compartments uh, airtight? Yes. 
That's They're probably exactly. going to have emergency seals too that can seal off parts of the ship. Yep. And I think the other thing that you'll see is you'll see spaces in the ship that are open to space going into battle. I think you will see that. You will see a, for lack of a better term, an armored inner core, which is your primary combat and your primary propulsion. And outside of that, which is your living quarters, everything else, potentially can be open to space. And you mean open to space or just evacuated? Evacuated. Like, yeah. I could see that they would just suck all the air back into the main tanks and leave the parts of the ship that aren't going to be occupied, evacuated. That yeah, certainly might help discourage boarding too. Hmm. Well, I'm sure yeah. boarders be wearing suits though. <laughs> yeah, but it's still, it makes that a really, really, really dangerous proposition. Not that it already wouldn't be, you know, oh, yeah. it might even be pretty unrealistic. Cause I mean, the one thing I think we forget about space is the sheer distances and speeds involved. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to stop, there's a reason to stop and completely stop. And it's probably not, you know, not a very good one. <laughs> and that's well, not I mean, you don't have to. You don't have to stop to board somebody. You just have to match speeds with them. <laughs> True. It might just be easier the other way, but you know. But even with that, if you've ever tried to maneuver a ship at sea, it, it's similar to what they would do in space. If you've ever watched, oh. Uh, anything docked with the ISS or with Mir back in the day. It's an hours long process because they have to ease in literally feet at a time. Because if you go in too fast, you're either going to crunch what you're mating with, or you're going to crunch your ship. So that, that's, that's why when I write no science fiction, my battles are basically off screen. Because they're not well, really. I mean, that's that's with our current technology, though. I mean, when you when you have when you have starships. I mean, I think people when not even just start just you just had a space navy. Yeah. The, the sheer technology you would need to keep that up there, you know, like on a permanent basis, would kind of dwarf what we have now. Oh, I mean, yeah. it, would, it would be. Hopefully, they'll have mastered the whole. Docking in a few minutes. <laughs> so I wonder if in space you're going to have the same. So when I was um, one of my MLSs in the army was bosun's mate. We called a watercraft operator, and they always when we were doing the training on on steering the vessel, they teach you to war to watch overcorrecting because if you're off by a little bit and you try to correct but you do it too fast, you go too far the other direction and you go back and forth and they call it chasing the compass. I wonder if that is going to apply in space when it comes to navigation. Because you don't have the the waves or anything pushing against you, that, that affects your navigation. It's a lot of uh, math, basically in space. I would say three dimensional yeah. movement, yeah. right? I mean, that's the other thing too. Is that's where seamanship and airmanship kind of come together. Because yeah. I mean, you're, you're moving extensively potentially in three dimensions and rotating about multiple <laughs> uh, at once potentially yeah. as well, or at least prevent, or better yet, probably trying to prevent that. My own Air Force opinion. refueling. Perfect example. Oh, yeah. My own opinion on how the, that, that would go and what I have come, I mean, way, the way I think it would wind up happening is, and this is partly because I don't want to have complete computer control of everything in the story because it's not as interesting, but I think they're going to have the thing where basically you tell the ship where you want to go and the computer figures out how to get there the right way, where you don't have somebody overcorrecting because you just say dock with this ship and or or go, you know, this is where I want to end up. And the computer sets the course and guides you automatically. I don't so think you don't they're think gonna somebody like nudging the stick. So you don't think the enterprise where you got the actual person hitting the buttons to drive the ship, you don't think that's going to happen anymore? No, I think you will push the button, but that button is going to be, hey, computer, this is where I want to go, and this is how I want to get there. And you just that do it. Every ship is a computer virus away from a crash. Yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, 
I mean, right now we're, we're computer viruses away from a lot of problems. <laughs> Valid, but there's always emergency procedures too, right? I mean, True. Yeah. you know, so there's always going to be some degree of operating, if not manual, manual assist, even if it's not meant to, oh yeah, I can completely take over like nothing's going on. Even if it's just a dude, get this thing straight and left, straight and level or pointed away from hitting anything so that then we can do something to rescue the, the crew or the passengers or whomever, or to make it safe to eject or, you know, separate yeah. from the, uh, the mothership or something like that. I mean, that's, there's always, there's always that too. I mean, let's not forget, I think it was Alan Shepard had to, had to actually fly the capsule manually for at least part of yeah. his, uh, his first yeah. flight, just enough to at least reset the attitude on it. I'm, well, I'm sure people will still be trained on doing it. I just don't think they're going to count on it on a regular basis. Yeah, but you think about it, too, going into combat, for example, Navy reference here, aft steering and a secondary bridge. You know, that goes mm -hmm. back to, oh, probably the first actual inboard rudders where there was some way to go back there and manually turn the rudder. Uh, there, there was a... Uh, a little known thing you could do with the, the battleships to do a slam stop where you actually went back and manually control the rudders to turn them both in. And it was actually like a speed break. But the amount of leakage you got if you ever did that was real interesting. But that capability exists today, even on the nuclear carriers. They've still got to have steering. And it's two poor guys or girls sitting back there at a control panel, twiddling their thumbs and waiting until somebody tells them what to do or they're released. And you have CIC today, which you did not have back then, which is basically CIC can run the entire ship, including the bridge. Well, I'm sure in the future they'll have auxiliary control rooms that can take over if the bridge is is yeah. compromised. I mean, not just, not just like modern, like the bridge gets hit by a shell, but even if say the, the power or computer connections to the bridge yeah. gets severed, by like a railgun round going through your ship, right. you'll have to have somewhere else that can control it. Something else to keep in mind too, is we'll probably see more use of unmanned craft and, you know, getting back to like the earlier parts of this conversation too if you were focusing a lot on unmanned craft, you could, it's probably easier and less expensive than to make things that might be dual purpose, wet and wet undersea and even space uh, capable in the long run. Because, I mean, I think I just saw an article saying that the Air Force and the Navy are looking to produce several hundred of, uh, you know, cooperative, what do they call them, loyal wingmen, uh, airborne, you know, uh, support drones for just the, the manned fleet here over the next couple of years. And that's going to be a big game changer. And, and don't forget now you've already got unmanned uh, naval vessels of different sizes that either different forces are using. And there's been some reports out of, you know, about the Ukraine conflict that those are in heavy use now as well, depending on the source you read. Now, yeah. now, so do you, do you think these unmanned are going to get to a point where they're just mirroring or slaves to the pilot and his fighter, or are they still going to be uh, remotely operated by a pilot on the ground somewhere else uh it yes can go either way they can yes. be slaved uh to the fighter that's basically loyal wingman philosophy when i was still working with some of this stuff was that it would basically be the wingman in other words you would have one manned and one unmanned aircraft and the unmanned would mimic everything that the manned aircraft did and now, since then, they have developed other technologies where the drone, for lack of a better term, is not actually correct. It's a UAV, would have the capability through a relay to conduct other operations as directed by either the Rio in the backseat of the manned fighter or by ground control. So it could actually be used to go in and do a bombing run. Or it could be used as an EW platform. Or it could be used as photo intel. And you know, that kind of hits up on one thing too, is uh, going all the way back to the beginning of this, whether a wet Navy would still be useful, maybe the emphasis would be on unmanned, on unmanned platforms. 
uh, in a wet Navy situation, especially if you're dealing with, uh, you know, you have a space Navy, you know, or you're primarily doing police actions and counter piracy and things like that. Maybe in that case, then, you know, you, there's more unmanned ships out there and most of them are tiny or fairly small compared to big, you know, like uh, targets, like essentially like an aircraft carrier would be a great target from orbit. I would imagine because, you know, Hey, big ocean, little, little bow at, but, uh, carrier is still pretty big. And, uh, you know what I mean? Well, I, I think a lot of that depends on if you're actively in a war or just doing, as you said, police actions against pirates, people who wouldn't have high technology. If you're actively against the, a near peer or peer enemy at that point, it may, there may be a danger of the ECM really uh, messing with our unmanned drones. Well, yeah, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is I'm trying to think of how I can say this and not get in trouble. <laughs> uh, even in peacetime, if you have an unmanned vessel out there, say an unmanned surface vessel, there is nothing to prevent the opposing force, friendly, unfriendly, third party, whatever, from going and taking that vessel, physically stealing it. I've had that happen on a test where I had test systems in the water and had the Chinese fishing fleet huh. come in and pick it up. And had to have a ship go chase them down to get it back. Fishing. Yeah, they're fishing all right. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine was... having to uh, explain that to your commander in paperwork. In oh. <laughs> Trust me, that was an interesting phone call. <laughs> <laughs> See, what had happened was, sir. <laughs> <laughs> there I was. <laughs> no shit. You started with yeah, that's what I was going to say. When you started with no shit, there I was. All right, so um, any final thoughts? Because I'm trying to practice our pacing, dear listeners, so we keep you close to an hour. Um, any final thoughts as we wrap this puppy up? I well, I think that there's, as Chris was saying, especially uh, a lot of room for underwater submarine uh, Navy activity in a future that has a Space Force. Do you see a potential where you end up getting with a sub, uh, excuse me, an aircraft carrier type effect where you've got a submarine designed to send out smaller one or two man or unmanned subs um, to extend? I think training? unmanned, I think unmanned underwater drones are a real possibility. Because then you take uh, the reach of a uh, submarine and make it the ability to reach out like a carrier would. Yeah. To some extent, depending on how sophisticated our uh, control systems are. True, true. Although if we have FTL, I would assume that some of that technology has obviously gotten better. So once we find the unobtainium. All right, Jim, any any closing thoughts? I think one thing that we've shown is all of us have slightly different ideas. Yeah. So again, <laughs> it depends on what your perception is, what you want to write, and the potentials for going any number of ways either a Navy force, a convertible force that could do multiple things, a rescue force, you know, write it where you want it to. All right. So at some point in time, we're going to need Kevin Costner to jump out of his helicopter to save the drunkards. So, I mean, you're <laughs> going to need something. All right. Final thoughts, Chris? Uh, just this. Um, you know, unless you're dealing with a complete post-scarcity kind of thing or even just a, hey, we can make whatever we want, infinite power regeneration, technology is all about trade-offs and choices. And you're going to pursue one thing, and it's often going to be at the expense of something else. So I wouldn't necessarily take – I think you got room to play with taking it for granted that just because a, uh, a FTL capability is out there, it doesn't render certain low-tech uh, solutions out of the beyond the pale or even still available or difficult to counter. I mean, you look throughout the whole history of the real world, uh, 
Cold War era of aircraft and other technological developments, there's a lot of roads that weren't traveled. And sometimes that was as simple as a preference decision, let alone, you know, choices or, you know, let alone uh, resources or anything else. Sometimes it's just a nod. This is how we want to do things. And so something really promising gets left on the table. Doesn't make it any less viable. Just makes it the result of a choice. This reminded me of that meme where you have the uh, Roman legionnaires running out of the back of a helicopter, and it says, "When you don't balance your tech tree and civilization." Hmm. <laughs> well, all right. The, the other thing it really comes down to, bottom line, as Chris said, is cost. What are you going to give up to get that capability? Yeah. All right. So uh, as we bring this to a close, Jim, what are you writing at the moment? <laughs> You're going to love this. Working on a 1870s Western. Oh, I do think the Western series. With underwater yeah. stone shirts. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK. I'm definitely going to read that. So uh, hit me up when it comes out. Um, I, I take it you were a fan of Louis L'Amour back in the day. Yeah, I grew up reading Louis L'Amour, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, of course, Heinlein. E. E. Doc Smith, yeah. and Zane Gray, the classics. All right, these all the links will be in the show notes. But Jim, where can listeners find you on the internet? Uh, I'm out there multiple places. I know you're going to put it up in the link. The other guys want to talk to. All right, Rick, what are you writing at the moment? I am finishing up the third book in the World War Mars uh, series. Uh, it's about an alien, an ancient alien starship crash lands on Mars and all the earth nations are racing to get there first and what happens afterwards. Okay. I'm definitely going to have to check that one out. And uh, how can listeners find you on the wild, wild interwebs? Uh, you can look for a Rick Partlow on Amazon. I'm the only one that writes science fiction on there that I'm aware of. Um, go to facebook.com backslash duty on our planet for the science fiction worlds of Rick Partlow I have a blog at rickpartlow.com that I don't write on much. Um, <laughs> that's about it. And like right. at that YouTube channel on writing science fiction, how to write science fiction that doesn't suck. Always a noble ambition. All right, Chris, what are you writing at the moment? I know you're still doing the, the military thing and your time is limited, but I, I understand you you're writing again. Yeah, I am. As, uh, as soon as we uh, knock it off here, I'm uh, going to put the finishing touches on a, story submitting for one of Rackin' Tour's many open calls uh, that's due tomorrow, and uh, wish me luck on that one. This one is God. not quite mill, mill sci-fi, but we'll call it mill sci-fi adjacent. Okay. They're, uh, they put out a lot of good anthologies. You can find their open calls if you're interested in seeing what they're doing on their sub stack. Uh, we've interviewed them before, so if you if you check Rackin' Tour Press, uh, it's in season four where they talk about all, all their anthologies, so it's, it's worth checking out if you're interested in that sort of thing. I am desperately rushing to put the finishing touches on edits for Derelict, which is the uh, republishing of a book I wrote, ooh, 2019. Uh, it had a lot of problems with it. I unpublished it, and now I have a Navy co-writer who's making my sailors not sound like soldiers. Uh, it was a thing. And so uh, I'm working with Dave Hensley on that one, and we're, he took essentially a Brandon Sanderson-length novel. We split it in two, and we turned it into a series. Um so it's, it's been a lot of fun, but we have the ambition of getting it done in time for him to take physical copies to Liberty Con, which I think is June 20-something. So uh, I have to have it done by the 25th of May, because we're recording this in early May, in order to have the uh, the publisher be able to edit it and, and format it and do all the things. So, And as usual, you can find us on our link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R, um, backslash blast or excuse me slash blasters and blades podcast again link tree slash blasters and blades podcast where we link to all the things the bit shoots the rumbles the youtubes the tiktoks until it disappears from the internet our twitter you can email us at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com for professional purposes only we have our facebook group and facebook page and last but not least we have madam stabby stab on the instagram twitter and email where you can find out all things horrific because she is a horror fan uh you can send all the hate mail to her and she will reply and make you cry 
uh, we have our website at anchor.fm slash blasters tech and tech blades for a little bit longer. It is anchor.fm slash blasters tech and tech blades. I'm in the process of working with the support team to uh, merge the anchor FM with Spotify because they have been bought out. So however long that takes is up to the internet gods. I do not know. As soon as it changes, we'll put it on the link tree, but you can support us there for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on. You could support our show more directly at buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Uh, be sure to put in the comment section is for the podcast, and I will keep my co-host duly caffeinated with that coffee brand coffee. Use the link in the show notes and the code podcast grunts, and you get 10% off of the coffee made in America. What's better than that? And you help keep the lights on, and we appreciate it. So with that being said, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For my absentee co-host, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters okay. of Blades podcast. We'll be back next week as we indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. All right, I appreciate you three coming on, and if we have more ideas on the subject of Space Navies, you will all get an invitation back. Dear listener, if you have future questions you want us to tackle, uh, send them in the comments, and we'll add it to the list. The list is growing. We're at least good for topics through, I don't know, season 20, I think, with all the ideas you've given us. So uh, we'll add this to the, to the record pile. And with that being said, thank you guys. Thank you all. And we are out.